Hey there. In this video, I'll share with you some of my general tips as well as my own setup for the advent of code. And although these will be more applicable if you plan on doing it competitively for time, some of these tips will also be fairly applicable even if you're just doing it for fun or to grow your skills. Before I get on with the video though, I just want to give a massive thank you to everyone for your support. I've just hit a thousand subscribers on my channel and I never expected to ever get to this point. So thank you, it means a lot to me. So let's get on with this. So before I begin, I'd like to share with you my own setup for using this. So here are some of the script aliases that I have set up. You can find this on my GitHub repository for my advent of code solutions, which I will post in the description. And you can add these to either your bash RC or your bash aliases. You can tweak these around a bit for your own purposes if you're using something like fish or a Z shell, for example. Uh, but I use bash, so I'm just going to only have the uh, bash ones up here. And so what these do, um, make sure you, s if you're going to use these, make sure you set the AOC environment variable to the directory in which you have all of your solutions. And specifically, you'll need to name your files a certain way, which I'll go over in a bit. Um, you'll also need to set your AOC cookie. Now, of course, it's generally speaking a bad idea to pull your authentication details and just put them in some random script. However, it's just 20 lines, so you can very easily verify what exactly it's doing. So in order to do that, you'll want to um, go into inspect element and you'll want to go into storage and you'll see here that there is a session cookie and you'll want to copy the value of that. I'm obviously not going to expand and show you the whole thing. Okay. And so what the first block does is it runs Python solutions. So unfortunately this script only works for Python or JavaScript, but you can also add additional uh, scripts for your own languages. Um, also this load function I'll go over later, that one's useful for everyone. Um, so in this case, you'll need to name your uh, file solution.py and you'll need to have Python 3 installed and you'll need in.txt to be your main input file and test.txt to contain any other test data that you might want to use. You can ignore this. And this gives you access to three different aliases. AOS, the S standing for solution, runs the solution on the actual t uh, data. AOT, the T standing for test, runs your uh, solution on the test file and it outputs it in blue. And finally, AOC, um, just because it's called AOC, just runs both of them, the test first and then the full solution. And so this is useful if you know what the test output should be so you can verify it and then immediately copy the real answer and paste it into the website. These work for JavaScript. You'll need to install bun, which you can do at bun.sh, and you'll need to name your file solution.js. You'll have the same input uh, files. And in this case, um, because JavaScript doesn't play too well with standard input, instead of piping in the files, I've just made it uh, pass the file name in as the second argument. So you'll need to access that via the command line arguments. And it's the same as the Python ones, except there's a J at the start because JavaScript. And finally, this AOC load function is honestly probably a bit excessive. It saves you maybe two or three seconds but that could count for a couple of places in the early days. And so what it does is it just loads in the test data. That's all it does. And so that's why you need to supply your cookie. If you don't want to use this function, don't supply your cookie here. And what it does is it lets you load in test data. So let's open up my AOC repository. So here, if I run AOC dash load, um, you'll see that it puts the input directly into in.txt. And here it's telling me not to request the endpoint before unlocks because today is not an AOC day. So you can also supply in the year and the day to get test data for a specific day. So for example, if I want 2021's day 13 input, I'll get it here. And remember that this is unique per person. That's why it needs your cookie specifically. Let's load in 2015 day ones as I'll be using that to demonstrate some things later. So that's my setup. Um, you of course don't have to use any of this, 
However, this um, you might find useful. It could save you a couple of seconds depending on your usual workflow. And I just find these a lot more convenient than typing out anything myself. And although it's very strict and opinionated on how you have to set up everything, you can just change this to whatever you want. With that said, let's move on to some more technical tips about the actual solving itself, because that's probably what most of you came here for. So the first tip I have is to keep your code straightforward and easy to both read, understand, and modify. Now, you might think that because you're trying to go for speed, it makes sense to write shorter code. And to an extent that makes sense, you don't want to write extra verbose, verbose code that goes through a bunch of steps that it doesn't need to. However, shorter isn't always better. And let's take a look at 2015 day one as an example. So for this one, Santa's trying to deliver presents in an apartment and he can't find the right floor. We have opening parentheses being to go up, closing meaning to go down. And the building is very tall, so there are no upper or lower bounds. And so the question is, what floor do the instructions take Santa to? So the short way to do this would be like so. We can read in all of the data using the open zero dot read trick for Python. And then we can just print out x dot count open bracket minus x dot count close bracket. And we see that this works. However, the only reason I was able to do that so quickly is because I've already thought about this problem about 500 times, because every time I do any sort of testing with my AOC stuff, I always use this problem. And every time I give any general tips, I also always come to this problem. The more straightforward way that requires basically no thinking and is not that much slower to type out is to just loop through each character and then just go up or down each time. So that way you don't have to think about a way to aggregate it. Now, this is a poor example because this wouldn't really take you all that long to figure out, but for some slightly more complex ones that you'll find in about day five to 10, sometimes trying to optimize your code or shorten it might actually end up taking you more time because you have to think about it and it's also more error prone. So let's do this instead. We can set a floor to zero and then for each character in open zero dot read, If the character is open bracket, f plus equals one. Otherwise, f, or sorry, if character is equal to close bracket, f minus equals one. And then we just print f. And so if I didn't make so many typos, this would not be that much slower to type than the first solution and requires you basically no thinking. The other reason this is particularly useful is if we look at part two. Now we want to find the position of the first character that causes him to enter the basement. If we did our first method, we'd have to just completely start over. Nothing in the first method even slightly is useful here. However, because we did this via a loop, which is the more straightforward and direct way of implementing it, we can just add a couple of modifications here and we have our answer. And this is a common theme you'll find in some of the earlier problems, which is that if you just implement it very straightforward according to basically what the problem describes instead of a different algorithmic solution that arrives at the same answer, you'll often find it easier to augment it for part two. In this case, we can just say for index and ch in enumerate open zero dot read, and then each time we can just say if f is equal to negative one, we can just print i and break. And um, you also have to keep in mind that the AOC usually uses one indexing. So typically your I will need to be I plus one. I forgot about that. But that's also an important thing to keep in mind, which is just that um, in, you see here that this is the first character, which is index zero, but AOC uses one indexing. So you just need to offset it because uh, most, uh, most languages will also use zero indexing. Okay, so that's basically the first tip. To recap it, essentially just don't focus too much on shortening your code. Um, of course, I don't mean you should write suboptimal code and for the later problems, you'll need to optimize it, otherwise it'll take forever to run. But a more straightforward method is usually easier to think about, is less prone to you making errors, and 
is more importantly much more easy to augment into a uh, solution for part two. For my second tip, you often want to write assertions. And what I mean by that is at certain stages in your program, it's a good idea to double check that you're not doing something wrong and to ensure that any assumptions you've made are actually held. Because you're writing a one-time program and you don't expect it to run in some production environment and require stability, it is much better to error than run into any undefined behavior. And so here's an example. We can put an else statement here and throw like, uh, what was it again? Throw runtime, sorry, raise runtime error and say like, oh, we don't need to give it anything. We just raise it. And so this will work fine here. But let's say, for example, that when we were test, uh, when we were writing this line, we forgot to remove the close bracket that VS Code automatically generates. This part is obviously wrong. And we'll get an error when we try to run this. And this is very important because if we didn't have it, then our code would output the wrong answer. And obviously here we can easily see that this is wrong. But in general, making assertions helps you avoid silly little mistakes. Here, we've made the assumption that the only possible situations are open bracket and close bracket, but we haven't actually ensured that that is the case. And so this is just wrong. And this can also be useful if your input parsing is wrong, for example. Let's say we did for i ch and enumerate open zero instead. If we output ch each time, we see that that actually reads the whole line because looping through new, uh, open zero goes line by line instead of character by character. Now here it would again be very obvious to spot, but this is just an example. If we went back to here and fixed this line as well, this would be, uh, oh yeah, it doesn't print anything in this case. If we go back to our part one solution, we see that we get zero as an answer because ch is just the whole line and is never equal to open or close bracket. And of course here it's easy to spot, but if we did an assertion, we would be able to easily see that there is actually an issue and ch is not what ex we expect. And we can raise the runtime exception with ch to get a look into what it is. And here we can easily see, oh, it's because we accidentally read the whole line. And so then we can go and fix that. And now our assertion prevents us from running into unexpected behavior. To recap this tip, in many situations where you're making some assumptions, the most common example I can think of is this exact situation where you're trying to have an exhaustive match or a chain of if and else if statements. You don't want to just leave nothing at the end and just assume that it's going to be exhaustive. It's a good idea to double check your work. This can also be useful if your intermediate values don't seem to be making sense. You can insert assertions to check if the value is actually being computed wrong, or if you just have some mistake in your input parsing, for example. The final tip I have, and this may be a bit obvious, but it's an important one to still know, is don't be afraid to take a short break, like one or two minutes, and take a step back from what you're currently doing and take a look at the bigger picture again. Sometimes it's easy to get caught up in one idea and go down a rabbit hole of implementing uh, more and more complex chains of logic. And sometimes if you just take a step back and look over it again, you realize that you missed a really obvious approach that you just didn't allow your brain time to develop because you were too caught up doing implementation. Now, of course, for the easier days, it's probably not a good idea to take one or two minutes off because that's how long the leaderboard takes to fill up, but it can still be a good idea to just take a couple of seconds to look through the problem again and make sure you haven't missed something, especially if your solution seems to be taking longer than you expect to figure out. And of course, as a final bonus tip, th this one should be fairly obvious. If you're doing this competitively for time, just make sure that you can actually commit the time to it. Make sure that you've cleared out every day at the time that you plan on writing the contest um, on every day that you plan on participating and make sure you won't be interrupted. So with all that said, that's some of my general tips. And again, I'll link my um, 
advent of code repository in the description along with this script file. It's probably not going to be particularly useful for you, but feel free to take a look through it and take out anything that you think would be useful to your workflow. That said, thank you very much, and I hope you learned something.